Uh, yes, so uh, currently I'm working uh, as a software engineer at a company called Learn Capital. They're a venture capital company and I'm consulting different startups in their portfolio. So I have to bootstrap a lot of projects. And uh, also, yeah, you can see that I'm doing some open source. So in general, uh, that's how I spend most of my day. I'm just programming. In uh, April in Mar or in March, I finished the book that I've been working on for about six months. I had the privilege there to get technical review by Mishko Heavery. And unfortunately, after the breaking changes in the RCs, it's kind of out of date. But uh, by the end of the year, I'm going to update to the Angular final, and uh, it is going to be up to date even with Angular 4, as you can, uh, as you heard during the keynote. So a little bit, a little bit of a story time. Uh, basically, this presentation it is going to be based on my experience working on the different startups uh, with Learn Capital, and so we are going to explain, uh, we are going to explore different aspects that we can apply in our software engineering, in our, in our development process. So we are going to explain an, an architecture which is going to help us to deal with some specific set of constraints that we are going to define. But uh, this uh, disclaimer, I want to say that the architecture that we're going to describe, it's only an architecture. So it doesn't define any specific interfaces that we must, def that we must implement in our code base. And also, these are only suggestions, not rules. So it, if you don't follow any of them, this doesn't make you a bad person. You can just follow only some of them and uh, improve your code base and code reusability if you think that makes sense for you. On top of that, uh, this architecture works for me great, although I think that it is generic enough and it works in the general case, it may not work perfectly for you, so you can modify it a little bit, bend it in order to fit your use case perfectly. And uh, in order to make the introduction complete, I want to define the difference between design and architecture. How many of you have read this book, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture? Yeah, it's a good one, I definitely recommend it. In this book, Martin Fowler defines architecture of decisions as all the decisions that are hard to change, in contrast, in contrast to design, which are some decisions which are like easier to adapt during the lifespan of the project. So we're going to define uh, some foundational architecture for our application in the context of Angular, and so this architecture is going to be based on some, high, some uh, set of uh, high-level constraints. First of all, since I've been working on startups, and as you can imagine, the, the requirements there are quite dynamic. I've been using Angular and React uh, since recently, only Angular 2. The requirements are really dynamic, so we don't want to write code that we need to rewrite every six weeks, for sure. We want to have a single code base that is going to be like following at least the open close principle, which is going to be open for adding new functionality, and we don't want to modify existing one. We don't want to break things. Also, it want we want to have a flexible and scalable data layer. From this slide, does this doesn't mean much, but in general, we want to have to be able to communicate with different services by using different communication protocols, different data format. So we can communicate with the RESTful API or uh, with, uh, for instance, WebSocket application server, or we may want to communicate with different WebRTC clients, like through uh, different uh, other peers, through WebRTC data channels by using different communication protocols. So we need to build some level of abstraction in order to be able to handle binary protocols such as Barrett RTC or even JSON if we want to communicate through a RESTful API. It doesn't make sense to use something binary. It's better if it is human readable. And we want to also to have a scalable team and code base. Every startup dreams that has it, ha it will have eventually a scalable team, like a team that is going to grow. And in most cases, even the team doesn't grow much, the code base does. And we don't want to write code that nobody can understand and we cannot understand either. So this is another specific constraint. I guess it's uh, general for most projects that we're working on, hopefully. And these high-level constraints, they somehow determine the high-level decisions that we need to make. A couple of them, uh, which we already described the constraints, and uh, let's see how we can handle the dynamic requirements and the flexible data layer. So we can apply a foundational principle from the object-oriented programming. You know that we have four foundational principles there, and one of them is abstraction. 
Of course, this is a very basic principle and uh, it is nothing that complicated. So we're just going to get some concrete implementations. We're going to extract the common functionality between them. We're going to put it into some abstract uh, thing, some abstract class. And we're going to also put some abstract operations there, which later need to be specialized, like implemented by the, sp by the concrete implementations. Here we have a WebRTC gateway, WebSocket gateway. There are a couple of common things here. We're using them for communication. We have data stream, we have push messages. So we can just implement this general functionality into the gateway and leave uh, the implementation details for the WebRTC gateway and the WebSocket gateway implementations. The scalable, and, uh, the scalable data layer and the scalable team and code base means that we need to be explicit in the code that we write. By explicit, I mean that we want to have explicit state mutations. We don't want to own a single reference to a huge global mutable object and modify this reference from hundreds of components because this is going to introduce a lot of issues. And we also want to let the client evolve independently from the services that we're working on, that we're communicating with. So if the domain changes, if uh, the domain model changes in the services somehow, the representation of the data, uh, the business layer, we want to be able to just uh, map this business, business model representation to our uh, current implementation inside of, the inside of the front end. This kind of in the indirection is convenient in most cases. We also want to have a scalable data layer. And uh, so we have a lot of sources of mutation of our state. And we can handle this thanks to a consistent state management, which has two parts. We also we ha want to have a single instance of each business entity, and we also want to have explicit updates. So if we have user with ID 1, we want to have only a single instance of this user. We don't want to have uh, a couple of users with ID 1s with different usernames and different uh, birth date or whatever, because this is going to introduce inconsistent user interface, like which is uh, something that we don't want. And we can solve this by having a single instance of each business entity. And uh, we can solve this by using an identity map. This is pattern defined by, my by, my by Martin Power. And we're going to apply it in a similar way, but uh, with slightly modified implementation details. We also want to have explicit updates of the state. So we want to introduce very strict conventions that we are following. And a pattern which is already well recognized that follows most of these things that we described right now, maybe not in the sense that Martin Fowler described them, is Redux. How many of you are familiar with Redux? Awesome, super. So we're going to build some kind of an abstraction like a wrapper around Redux in order to be able to take uh, advantage easier of the dependency injection mechanism of Angular and also define the data layer. So we're going to use something like Redux on steroids. Uh, we, you, we can apply the architecture that we're going to describe just in a moment with any tech stack. Uh, I've chosen Angular 2 with RxJS and NGRx. NGRx is a great Redux-like implementation which uses observables. Also TypeScript because we want to build something that's, that scales and TypeScript is, TypeScript is get great with its type checking which helps us discover some of the problems in our code base even uh, during compilation time. And we also want to use immutable JS. This is a set of implementation of different persistent data structures that will help us to implement our immutable state, for instance, in our architecture. And in order to demonstrate the specific implementation of the architecture easier, I built a simple application which we're going to use as a context in the slides after that. So here we have a very simple app, which basically aims to help us write type quicker. We have the text above the text box, and we need to type it as quickly as possible. As you can see, I'm not doing great here. Yeah, when we do something wrong, uh, we see the text red. Text, the text box is getting red, and after that we see the progress, which is horrible here, 17 seconds. Uh, during the single player mode, uh, the each individual keystroke should be should be sent usually to the server in this case. So we have we are communicating with one service. We also have a uh, multiplayer mode where different clients communicate together by using WebRTC data channel. Here they exchange different binary messages with bar RTC as far as I remember what I did here. 
Once one of the users types something into the text box, the other user sees the progress. And uh, same in the opposite direction, vice versa. Once any of the users completes the text, he is announced as the winner. So the high-level architecture that we're going to apply has the following layers. First of all, we have UI components here, which are nothing more than the composite design pattern. We are just composing different components together in order to form the user interface of the application. We have a facade below. And this facade, at first, it may look like active record if you have used Ruby or something. So it looks like active record, and it abstracts the layers below. The state management, which is our Redux, kind of. And uh, here is also our set of asynchronous services. So the facade is going to help us achieve communication with these two components. Let's first start with the, with the UI components, which are located right here on top. So this is just a simple Angular component, and the interesting thing that we can notice here is that it accepts, by using the dependency injection mechanism of Angular, a game model. This game model is a thing that we need to delegate all the business calls to. So when we change something into the text box, we are delegating this uh, further execution to the user model and invoking its own progress method by uh, passing a specific argument. So that's our UI, comp that's our UI layer. We only have a couple, like we have a composition of different components which communicate through the rest, uh, with the rest of the system by using the models or the facade. And we can already make our junior developers productive because we can give them to develop UI components and so they can use the abstraction provided by the architecture. A couple of important things here are that the components, they contain only very simple presentational logic and they should contain as less state as possible. For sure, not any business state, maybe some UI state. They should delegate all the business calls to the models. And here are the models, the facade. The facade is kind of complicated at first. And uh, it's we have a single level of inheritance here, only a single level because we don't want to introduce additional coupling. And as arguments, by using the dependency injection, we are injecting the store, which is responsible for state management, and also a set of asynchronous services. Notice that we are depending on an abstraction here, a list of async services. Also notice that we are selecting a specific piece of the state here. We are selecting only the game. So we are invoking this.store.select game. So we are taking only a specific part of the state and exposing it to the UI components. We can think of this as some kind of an identity map where we have a set of uh, models and they point to the exact locations inside of the state tree and provide a stream of this piece of the state tree to the component tree. In our complete game method, we just uh, accept some set of arguments and we create an action. This action is some kind of an internal protocol for communication within our application. So it has meaning only within the boundaries of our application. And by using this action, we're dispatching it through the store. So here is what is going to happen. First of all, we have our component, our model, and NGRX. Once we invoke complete game, we're going to go from the components to the model the model is going to create an action, dispatch it. Later, NGRX, it is going to modify the state. It is going to create a new, st new store, a new state. And it is going to be dispatched by using the state observable, which is going to update the component. And we are also using this action in order to pass it to the asynchronous services, which are later going to map it to something which is understandable by them. So here are some, impor some important things. By using the models, we are mapping uh, the state stream. So we are just selecting a specific piece of the state stream and providing it to the rest of the components. We are also delegating the business logic to the reducers in NGRX. And we are delegating the data access logic to the synchronous services. But since we are delegating a lot of stuff, we need to be aware that we are actually not violating the single responsibility principle here. Because we can shoot ourselves in the foot this way. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so uh, now we are switching to state management. In state management, we have our store and a set of reducers. And uh, yeah, here is what is happening. Just to recap, uh, 
The, the components is invoking method of the model. The method is the model is creating connection. It is dispatching the section by using the store, the st by using the NGRX store. The NGRX uh, library it is mo it is creating a new store, and uh, the model is getting it. But now let's see what is actually going on inside of NGRX. So it accepts an action, and based on the action and the current state, they are being passed to the set of reducers, which are based on which based on the actions payload are creating a new state which later is being emitted through the state observable and is uh, respectively being handled by the component tree and here is a sample reducer so this is our game reducer which as arguments accepts a state and also an action based on the action type it performs some set of operations and after that returns the state and that's it this state later, it is being emitted by the state observable, which we can access through the game door in our component tree, and we can map it to a specific piece of it that we want to take, in this case, the current, the current text. And by using a very declarative binding, using the async pipe, we can just bind to this, this stream of current text from the game state. The important thing about the reducers is that uh, they're pure functions, so they should be very easy to test because they don't produce any uh, side effects and they also depend only on immutable arguments. And they implement the business logic of our app, which is very important. It's important to be able to unit test our business logic and make sure that it works. Now the last piece, these are the asynchronous services. So they are located right here on the layer diagram and uh, their role is to just send requests to the remote services eventually and uh, handle the responses. So here is the abstract interface, the abstract class that represents the async service. Uh, it has the abstract, uh, an abstract method called process and uh, it accepts a single argument of type action. So the asynchronous services are responsible for mapping this action to a, rem to a command which when being serialized it is understandable by the remote service. So the actions are internal protocol of communication, and we need to map them to what we want to our service to receive to. So here is our game peer-to-peer -peer service, and uh, it has a method process, so it implements this abstract method. Inside of it, we create a new command ba by using some command builder, and we're invoking the command. On the other side, the client is going to receive the serialized commands, it needs to parse it, and right after that, map it to a specific action which is already understandable by our system and uh, being uh, dispatched through the store, which is going to lead to the same like cycle of uh, changing, like creating a new state and uh, populating the templates. So the important thing about the asynchronous services is that they map actions to commands, they uh, map responses and messages which are actually the serialized commands to actions and uh, they use some abstract gateway. So this was it. Maybe in order to make sure that we're getting it right, uh, we're going to make a very quick recap. Uh, in this quick recap, we're going to illustrate how we are applying a... Uh <laughs> yeah, here it is again. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I have one even better by the end of the slides. <laughs> so uh, here is a uh, simple reg sample registration. So we have our sign up component, which uh, so the user submits the form. In the sign up form, we're just uh, invoking the sign up method of the user model. After that, this goes to this creates a new action by using an action creator. This action is being passed to the RESTful synchronous service. It creates a new command based on this action, which is being sent through the gateway. And once we get a response, we propagate all this thing to all the way back to the user model, which can decide whether the signup was successful or not. It uh, emits a new action, which is being handled by the user reducer, which based on the current state and this action creates a new state and we are just uh, getting the new state in the signup form, so we can eventually hide it or do whatever we want to. 
And that's pretty awesome. That's my next awesome slide. Uh, my next awesome GIF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you use this architecture. Okay, <laughs> so a couple of the properties of the architecture is that it has very predictable state management, kind of more predictable, predictable by the previous slide. It is testable because we can very easily mock some of the abstractions that we're using by, using by just providing different implementations in the provider's configuration. We can also use any uh, remote service. So our components, they are not coupled with any specific implementation, but instead they are coupled only with some abstract interface. We have serializ serializable uh, state, so we can either even not go to the network after once the state has been formed. We can, e we can even serialize it and put it into local storage or index DB or whatever, and later take it from there. Uh, we also have... Uh, models which can receive different set of services depending on the state. So we can define, depending on the context, we can define, we can use different sets of uh, synchronous services in the different parts of the component tree. And we have very easy management of asynchronous events thanks to RxJS. We can just map over them, filter uh, new uh, data emitted by observables and so on. You can take a look at a blog post that I wrote on this topic and also the sample application right here on this links on the slides. And uh, thank you for it, your attention. I'll be available right after the talk somewhere. Oh.